Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to read your word. I pray today that as we read in the book of Revelation, that we will experience the blessing that you promise. Heavenly Father, I pray today that we will leave here with a better understanding of who you are, that we, if there is hurting among us, may find the opportunity to praise you despite the hurt and to celebrate the promise that you're a God who shows up. You're a God with a message. You're a God who gives us purpose. Heavenly Father, we celebrate you this day. We celebrate you, Jesus Christ. We celebrate how the Holy Spirit is moving among us and throughout this land. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of Revelation. We are going to be beginning a series today on the seven churches listed in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. And then later on, maybe even the beginning of next year, we are going to have a Sunday night series that looks at the rest of Revelation in its completion. I wanted to spend some time looking, though, at the seven churches. Whenever you look at the book of Revelation, there are so many ways of of looking at it and thinking about it. There are scholars who devote their lives to understanding the different symbolism given in the book. It is a book chock full of different uh, symbolic activities. When I was growing up, my pastor did a series through Revelation, and it was on Sunday night, and I would be sitting on the back pew with my great aunt eating Smarties candies, paying attention, of course. And um, when I was very young, my mind, I didn't, I didn't have the best grasp of symbolism, and, and I was a very literal thinker. And some of the imagery in the book of Revelation gave me some very strange visions of what must have been happening. And I agree that they are fantastical, but a lot of it is symbolism, and a lot of it is, is, is about promises of things that are going to happen. This symbolism is here in chapter 1, as well as in the churches themselves. And I want to talk to you just a moment, explain to you how I'm going to be approaching the seven churches. There are some people who look at the churches as that, that John was writing specifically to these seven churches, and everything in the book of Revelation was fulfilled in a way that those people could understand it. Some people look at the seven churches as church ages, saying that this is what the church has looked like and what it will look like. And I mean, the church universal in its entirety, and these are different ages of the life of the church. I'm going to look at this as that these descriptions of these seven churches could be a description of any one of us. Any one of us could be a member at any one of these seven churches. Oakdale could be one of any of these seven churches, or perhaps a blending of somewhere thereof. And so as we go through these seven churches, I want you to look and ask yourselves, what does this say about me? Would I be a member at this church? Is, does this characterize my life? As Oakdale, I invite you to look at these seven churches and say, is this a description of us corporately? Does this describe us? And what should we do to change who we are, both as individuals and in a church? And of these seven churches, one is simply said that it's going to go through tribulation. The rest of the churches, there's something wrong with them that, that Christ points out about the church. But one thing I'm going to say to you today, both as individuals and as a church, for every one of these seven churches where there was a problem, there was an opportunity to repent and to have restoration as a church. So that speaks to us as a church and speaks to us as individuals. There's always an opportunity for repentance and restoration. So I'm going to begin looking at this, and we're just going to try and go through the entirety of chapter 1, and we're going to talk a little bit about who John is and a little bit about, about the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's one thing I want to say as we begin this book. Whenever we hit symbolism, whenever we hit, hit something we don't quite understand, one thing I want to tell you, the book of Revelation, beyond any other interpretation, the book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ. Who he is, what he will do, what is going to happen because of him. So anytime you have a question of, of the meaning, say, what does this teach me about Jesus Christ? And let that be your guide for interpretation. Let's begin reading in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants 
the things that must, take, that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear, and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. I really love verse 3, because as we read Scripture, each and every Sunday we gather here today, it is my hope and my, my, my prayer that you will be blessed and that you will receive something from God's Word through the power of the Holy Spirit as, as, I, as I preach and as you read God's Word with me. But this Scripture in and of itself contains a promise of blessing. I get to receive a blessing today by reading it to you. You receive a blessing by hearing it. But that follows through that as we read it, as we hear it, we follow through. So I'm, I'm so happy you're here today that you get to experience this. And I hope that you will come back as we continue to read these chapters. Because there is a promise. As we hear it, as we experience it, as we follow it, we will be blessed. Verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who was and who, and who, excuse me, to, from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the king on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's pause here after this introduction that this is a message from Jesus Christ to his servants. And let's talk a moment about, about John. Not to praise and glorify John, but just to talk about him in his experience. John is one of the disciples. Oftentimes in the Gospels you read that Jesus would go away and would take three disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. John is described as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Many think that this may have been Jesus' best friend. He's someone that was, a, that was in the, certainly in the inner circle and was described as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He wrote five of the New Testament books. He was a man that would travel around and he would go and speak to the churches, speak to the first century churches, and actually have a, the ability to tell them about what it was like to live with Jesus. For the three years that he ministered with Jesus, he could actually tell them eyewitness accounts of the feeding of the 5,000, the raising of the dead, the, the blind receiving sight, the teachings and the preachings of Jesus Christ and the parables. He could go around and share this message with the first century church, encouraging them and strengthening their faith. Because of, of his, his preaching of God's word, we read here, in, it says in verse 9, I, John, your brother and partaker in the tribulation, because of his preaching and because there began to be a backlash against the early church, he was exiled to Patmos. Now, Patmos doesn't seem to have quite the jarring effect on us that it, maybe it should. If I said he, were, he was sent to Alcatraz, would that help some of us? This was like a prison camp. Tradition tells us that not only did Rome send him to the prison camp, that they, they tried to get rid of him, his teaching, by boiling him in oil. But he survived. Now that's not a biblical account, that's a traditional account, but let's just assume that it happened for a moment. The Romans, in an effort to suppress this growing Christian moment, they take John, the disciple, they try to boil him in oil, he survives, so they exile him to the island of Patmos. Patmos was a, was a dry, uh, rocky, unpleasant soil. You couldn't grow a lot there. It was a place where mining was done. 
And at this point in his life, he's pushing 70, 80, 90 years old. And think about his state as he's here on this island. He has seen the death or heard about the death of all the other disciples. Tradition again tells us that all the disciples in some way, shape, and form were murdered because of their faith. And he, he, he heard about the death of all of his, his, his fellow disciples. Exiled on this island, he could no longer visit the churches that he loved so much. He could no longer share his testimony with these growing churches that were trying to, to exist under the harsh conditions that Rome was placing upon them. He's old, he's tired, perhaps every day waking up suffering from the effects of the burning, maybe being forced to do hard labor. And he's alone, at least humanly speaking. I think there are many in our churches today who probably feel this way. There are many people in our churches who, who as you, you've gotten up in years, you've seen the death of your family and friends. You have less ability to get around and do the things that you want to do. There are some people we have in our churches who simply no longer have the ability to even come and fellowship with us. You may be listening to this on one of our CDs or online that we have set up, and you're in that exact situation. You feel alone. There's physical pain. There's emotional heartache. And I want to give you this message today as an encouragement, however, by showing you the testimony of a man who followed after Jesus and who was stuck on this island. He said, read again what was happening with him. Verse 10 says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, even that beginning of verse 10, there's so much there to unpack. To be in the Spirit it's sort of a sense that he was there and he was worshiping and praising God. He was, in a, he was in a place of worship. And then it says on the Lord's day. And again, we, we say the Lord's day and we automatically connect it to Sunday. But this would have been a new concept for the first century church. Because for, at least for Jews, you worshiped on Saturday. That was Sabbath. But when Christ was resurrected on a Sunday, Christians began to worship on the day of his resurrection. And it was called the Lord's Day because that was the day of, of his coming back to life. So Christians began to worship on that day. Or this could be a phrase that means each and every day because every day is the Lord's Day. I like to think of it that he's worshiping on Sunday. But again, the, 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 the meaning could be many things. It could mean that it was, he was just his daily practice of worshiping God. But even if this was particularly for a Sunday, notice that he is in the Spirit even though he's alone. Even though his body is hurting, even though he has no other believers around him that there is to speak of, he's been separated from the church, he's being punished by the government, but he gets in the spirit and he praises God. And then something wonderful happens for John. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Why seven? Why these seven churches? Let's take a look at the seven churches on the map, if we can. Right here you have the basic locations of these seven churches. In, and, and you see the island of Patmos down there. It's off what is now around Turkey. And so you see where he was on the island of Patmos and these seven churches. It's not that these were the only seven churches that existed. Some have said that maybe these were the churches that he helped establish. Or, or he was, a, no, not helped establish, but he would go in there and minister. Or maybe it's because of the certain situations that was going on in those seven churches. But biblically speaking, symbolically speaking, the number seven denotes completion, or denotes perfection. So you might say that he was writing to the, to the complete church, symbolically, by writing to these seven churches. And you can see where they would have been located. And so he's, the, the, the voice calls to him, thank you for the, for, the, for the map, 
Verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. This, we're beginning to read a description of Jesus Christ standing in his midst. And I want you to hear this description. Oftentimes when we think about Jesus, we think about him on the cross, or we think about him as the suffering servant, walking around trying to reach out to people, perhaps in shabby clothing, dusty and dirty, walking along the, the streets and the paths from city to city. And it's not that that is an inaccurate description, but it's not a complete description. We need to look not only at who Christ was when he was on this earth, but also who he is now. This is a description of the glorified Christ. And this is the God that we worship. And we need to know him as well, not just who he was during his earthly ministry. I have a friend that I grew up with. I went to church with him, and I went to college with him. I roomed with him in college. And when he was in college, he had a, a, a wild streak. And, and he did some things that, I, that were, were funny, and, 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 um, but there were things that he shouldn't have been doing. And he, later on, he went to seminary with me. And from time to time, whenever we would get together, I would bring up those things that happened in college. And I'd like to ribbon him about them because I got to, to see them happen. And I'd joke with him or I'd, I'd maybe even joke at his expense about the things that, that he did when he was in college. And one time, I remember, we got together for Christmas and it was me and a group of friends, and I began to bring something up that my friend had done in college, and I looked at him, and I saw his eyes roll. And I realized I had become that guy. I had become that guy who only can talk about the things that happened 10 years ago. And the reason I think in that moment, I just thought of so many things that he must be experiencing. I was thinking, I hate when he brings up these stories. This isn't who I am anymore. We have people like that in our lives, not just the people who can only think about the things that happened years ago, but many of us have people in our lives that all we have to relate to them is who they were or who we were. Anybody on Facebook? Better not be this moment, but you're on Facebook. Do you have friends on Facebook that you were friends with in high school and you clicked friend and you hadn't spoken to them since you clicked, yeah, I'll be your friend? We have those people. We call them our friends, but we have no life experience with them now. If they showed up in our house, we'd have to sit there and stare at each other, and all we could talk about was back in high school. And a lot of us, our relationship with Jesus Christ is similar in fashion because we know who he was and we're thankful for the sacrifice he did for us, but we have no standard relationship with him today. And we don't know who he is and how he's working and how he's operating. And our vision of him is only of the suffering servant and not as the resurrected Lord. It's not that that's inaccurate. It's just that it's not complete. I want you to take a moment and read with me the description of Jesus Christ in his glorified, symbolic state here. And if we think about him and we sing a song like, what a mighty God we serve, man, it'll resonate. We read here, it says, that I turned and in the midst of the lampstands I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And let me say that, that would be the appropriate response. I mean, can you imagine... Being in prayer and hearing the statement, see what you see, right in a book to the seven churches, and turning and seeing this vision of this man standing here, dressed like this. And again, some of this, this description also reveals to us his purpose. Read again the words where it says, His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. 
The sense of refining the furnace, the statement of, of eyes like fire, is a statement of, of, of this refining process. Whenever you have a metal or, or, or gold, you take it, and if you put it in a fire, what happens is when you get that fire hot enough, the impurities are burned out. And what you have is a more pure gold. Christ came, and he wants to refine us through his salvation. He wants to take the impurities that are in us out, and he wants to help grow us and mature us into that ultimate day of sanctification where we are with him. And he's working daily in our lives to work out the impurities that are in us if we will allow him. If we will give over ourselves and allow the refining fires of the Holy Spirit to burn within us and to create within us a sense of purity. That's part of what he does. Also, here's the description of a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And again, as a kid, my imagery was very literal. It's like he had a, had a big sword sticking right out of his mouth. But the symbolism there is that that is the word of God. It is a word of judgment. It is a word of correction meant to pierce and meant to correct our souls. And he's speaking these to the seven churches, and he's speaking them to us. But get that picture. That is the glorified, resurrected Savior of the world standing in the presence of John the Baptist. Excuse me, not John the Baptist. John the disciple. And John falls to his face as if dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. And then what I love here is that these seven golden lampstands, these seven stars, he gives us the interpretation of the imagery. He says, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. He's about to give a message to us. The Savior of the world, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, is about to deliver a message to us through his apostle John. And it's a message that we need to hear as a church. It is a message we need to hear as Christians. It is a message that your friends need to hear. It is a message that the church members who haven't been here in a while need to hear. You need to go find them. You need to bring them. They need to hear this message from Jesus Christ about our state, about our lives. These next weeks are going to be filled with both rejoicing as well as hopefully repentance. It's time, brothers and sisters. It's time as a Christian. It's time as a church for true evaluation and hearing from our Savior in these words who we are. But I want to repeat to you today, if you're here and you're hurting, if you're here and you feel separated from the church, if you're here and you feel alone, if, you're, if you feel that you are forgotten, you are not. One thing that's interesting about what John did is John was in the spirit. He was praising even in his lonely, hurting, aged state. He was praying before Jesus showed up. But when he began to praise him, Jesus revealed himself at this opportunity. Here's a promise given not only just implied in this, this passage, but throughout Scripture. If you go and you seek God, God is going to show up. How about an amen for that one, brothers and sisters? Knock and the door will be open. Seek and you will find God is there for you. Regardless of your state. Regardless of your sinful state. Regardless of your hurt. Regardless of your ache. He is there for you. Go to him. Praise him. 
worship in the faith that he is there and wait for his comfort and peace and strength. It may be a word of encouragement given to your heart. It might be something you read in scripture. It might be the friend come calling to just check how you're doing. It may just be a peace that passes understanding. You don't have to do it alone. For the rest of us, school is started, vacation time is, is, is passing. I want to ask you to, to seek to make a decision to come and hear these sermons. Because these churches are present a totality of what Christ wants to say to his church. We're going through them. We're taking a break on Homecoming Sunday, October 9th, and we're finishing out this for the rest of October. I invite you to come and be a part of this and bring your friends. It's an important word. He is there and he has a word for us. Let us celebrate our resurrected Savior. Let us continue our relationship with him, not just so we can say what Christ did for us on that day of salvation, but what he continually does in our lives and who he is today. Let us celebrate him and praise his holy name. I invite you also today to make the commitment to, to if maybe you don't know him, Maybe you, when I talk about salvation or when I talk about experiencing now, you've never experienced him. You've never known Christ as Savior. I invite you to come down this morning and say to me, I'm ready to accept Jesus as my Savior. It's not that you have to say it to me. It's just so that I can encourage you and pray with you and talk to you. Maybe today you just need to get something right with God. You have forgotten his grandeur. You have forgotten how wonderfully amazing he is. And you just want to spend some time here just, just literally or symbolically on your face in front of God because you realize how awesome he is. This altar is open. Maybe today you're looking for a church home somewhere that you want to, to be a part of where God's word is preached, where there is community and fellowship and encouragement. I invite you to come down front and let me know of your desire to join this church. Let's go to God together and pray about these different decisions. Heavenly Father, we come to you and as we begin this word, we see already an encouragement. God, you have not fallen silent. You have not fallen silent to your church. You have not fallen silent to, your, to the believers. You are there. Heavenly Father, We pray for the next coming series on the seven churches. God, I pray that we as a church might discover areas in our ministries that need to be strengthened. That we might find areas that don't just need to be strengthened, but where we need to repent. That we as Christians may become more serious about our relationship with you. But God, I also pray a word of comfort. There are people in our congregation who are close to us who may not literally be stuck and separate, but Lord, they feel it. To them, I pray. For them, I pray for peace. I pray to you that you would give them your presence in a powerful way and may we as the hands and feet of Christ also strive to be an encouragement to those who are hurting who are sad who are experiencing lives of quiet desperation God I pray that we might seek them out not only for comfort but also those who don't know you may we be the, be the conduits by which you save those people you introduce them to you Share with them the love of Christ. Call them as your children. We praise you for an opportunity to be a part of it. I'm down front. This altar is open. Make your decisions and your praises to him this day. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.